Welcome to the Simply Joyful Podcast Live with my special guest, Shanti Feldhahn. Get ready to be encouraged. Well, hello, Shanti, and welcome back to the Simply Joyful Podcast. It is such a joy to have you here. I can't tell you how excited I've been to get ready for this interview. I know, me too, especially since we had so many times of trying to reschedule this thing. I'm so glad we're here. This is awesome. I know it's so funny because, you know, we're actually officially on a break right now because I'm like, I just need a big, long, fat break. And I was laughing because I, I moved okay. everything. So I'm like, where's, wait, where's my mic? <laughs> so, You're a trooper for being willing to do this on your break. Oh my oh, goodness. No, I love it because you have just been such an inspiration to me and my family for so long. So I, I love that we got to do this, especially since... I've shared here and there with my audience that my husband, um, he's a financially minded man. Like, so he, um, we did a podcast interview and I let him explain what he did for 20 some odd years. <laughs> so I'm like, you put it into words, but he is awesome with finances. So when I got your book, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a good one. So your newest book is Thriving in Love and Money. And yep. I will say that it, it touched a couple nerves as I was reading your words. I was like, oh, she gets me. Like, oh, I think I get my husband. And that's what your books are so fabulous about. So I can't wait to dig in to your newest book. But before we jump into all that, can you share a little bit about yourself and your family and what it is that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Jeff and I have been married for 25, almost 26 years, which seems crazy. Like, how am I old enough? to do that. I think I'm in denial. Um, and we have two teenagers and um, we live in Atlanta and we're social researchers. So we basically, what that means is for the last, gosh, I guess 16 years-ish, we have been trying to dig out the things um, that really matter to make your life, to make your relationships great, and really focusing on the little things that we tend not to know or tend not to do. And uh, once we do them, it makes a big difference. And so, uh, yeah, this is this tackling this topic was a huge issue for relationships because everybody knows that money is one of the biggies. It really is, and. I have to say that um, I was giggling as I was reading through it because, I mean, I read page to page probably more than once your book for women only. And I think your my mother-in-law got my husband the for men only. I didn't ask him if he read it. I think I glanced at it a little bit. I felt like I was cheating because it said for men's, men only. I'm like, I'm curious what they say. <laughs> but I love the perspective of the book going from your point of view and his point, your husband's point of view, because um, we need that. <laughs> We need yeah. to see it. And, and it's always so shocking. It made me feel like I need to pull out the four women only book again, because it's been, goodness, I, I think I bought it right when it came out. And so it's been a long time. It's been a while. And there's a new edition and everything. Of oh, you're of kidding. Books. Okay. I'm I definitely going to have nope. to go pick, pick that up. But um, yeah, that is what's so fun about your book. So for anyone unfamiliar with Shanti and how she does her magic, you guys literally do all of this crazy research and you really help dig into what's beyond that. Because the biggest part of the book, and I'll let you explain that, is that when we argue about money, it's not really about money. So can you share a little bit about what, what it's about when we have <laughs> financial differences? You know, like, what, what is that? Yes, it's especially because and it's important to say right up front that this is not a book about how to have a great budget, right? Because first <laughs> right. of all, it's not at all out there on that, and you don't want my advice on how to have a great budget. <laughs> what we were trying to address was how do you have a great relationship around money? Because mm -hmm. for most people, I think it was ninety-two percent of people have some tension around money. And so, yeah, it was digging into all the research. And when I say the research, I should probably explain. We basically spent three years doing um, focus groups and interviews, and then all of our books, we do these big nationally representative surveys to try to figure out what percentage of people does something apply to, or how effective is a particular action. And um, we, that was the big thing. What you just said is that when you're having tension about money, it turns out it's not about the money. It turns out it's how money makes you feel, mm -hmm. how it makes your spouse feel. And there's this host of expectations and beliefs about how money should work and insecurities and fears, all this mm -hmm. stuff running under the surface that we don't even know is there. 
but that's the stuff that's causing the tension or if you avoid talking about money <laughs> like me and Jeff, yeah. <laughs> that's what's underneath there. So that's what we were focusing on is what is all that stuff? Because then once you know it, you can have a really, really good, healthy, non-awkward relationship around money, which is awesome. Oh, it's so important. And yeah, I was reading part of it to my husband this morning. I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> So that makes so much sense. Oh yeah, because yeah. I mean, because again, we um we have a very, for the most part, healthy relationship when it comes to our discussion on money. We really are like minded in so many ways, um. But there's still those underlying things. I was like, oh, she, it's there. Whoa, I didn't know that was there. And the conversation around Diet Coke, you talk about that in the book. It made me laugh so hard because I'm actually, I'm fine with water. My husband's fine with water. It's one of the, I mean, it is funny because that's one of the tips we give friends who are going through hard financial times. Cause like we're the ones that are trying to help people, you know, get it, not even like a better. budget, but just, yeah. you know, to make better choices. Cause we kind of joke that we're like squirrels. We save our nets. I mean, my husband retired at 47 and it's not that we're rolling in dough. We just make very um, strategic decisions about things. And it cracked me up. Um, because that was one of ours is we're water drinkers. And so it was fun to hear your perspective. (laughs) I have to tell you, I'm not going to turn the camera around because (laughs) it would give your audience vertigo. And some of you are listening on podcast and not on YouTube, but if I could turn the camera around, you would see that my husband has overheard this conversation and has come to the door of his home office and is going, Hmm, see, water (laughs) instead of that. So yes. So let me explain this. I know your audience is like, what? I know. <laughs> so, We're having our own private little conversation here. <laughs> yes, exactly. So here's what this is about. So one of the things that we found that's going on underneath the surface um, when it comes to money and your relationship is that, and this is actually, honestly, this is one of the biggies. This is this yes. is a really big day-to-day, everyday kind of deal for a lot of couples. Maybe not you. And your husband, okay? Because it sounds like you're on the same page on a lot. With that one, I'll say, I'll say that. With that, yeah. um, <laughs> but it turns out that one of the things that causes the the friction is that you're we just aren't valuing mm-hmm. what our spouse is valuing, and we don't realize that that's the case. It's almost like we sort of temporarily forget that we're different people, and so yes, of course, different things are going to matter to us. And the other person's values, like what they care about, is just as legitimate <laughs> as what you care about. It so is. The Diet Coke story is basically that when Jeff and I started off a relationship, when we got married, we were in Manhattan. And I was working on Wall Street. Jeff's an attorney at a big law firm. And we were making good salaries, but we had $135,000 of student loan debt from Harvard because Harvard yeah. is very expensive. And so we were chunking it out. And Jeff was very, very motivated. And it was kind of hanging over his head, which I understand, but we didn't know to talk about these things. Like it, it didn't occur to us. And so a couple nights a week, <clears throat> we would try to have a simple dinner somewhere before he went back to the office because he was working a hundred hour week. <sighs> yeah. And, um, and it would usually be a good dinner until the waiter said, can I get you anything to drink? And he <laughs> would order a water and I would order a Diet Coke. And Jeff would be thinking, well, that's a stupid use of $4 and 50 cents. Cause of course, New York expensive. And he would sort of push it aside until the guy comes by and says, can I get you anything else? And sometimes I'd order a refill <laughs> if I was thirsty and he'd be like, okay, now this is a really stupid use of, because there are no free refills, $9. Yeah. And, oh and so goodness. he would start to think she doesn't care about our finances. She doesn't care about how hard I'm working. She doesn't care about getting out of debt. Like, all of this stuff would start to circle. I wouldn't know that any of this was going on. All I would know is that my husband is shut down. I would have no understanding why. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until months and months later that we were able to have a conversation about it. And I don't even remember what spurred the conversation because a lot of us never even get to that point, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I was able to explain to him you know, we were newly married. He didn't know this, that I dislike the taste of water. Like, I don't know why I'm weird that way. I just don't like it. And, and so I don't enjoy my meal if I don't have something like iced tea or a soft drink or something to drink. Right. And I would rather 
instead of having a really nice steak dinner with water, I'd rather just stay home and save the money. Like, and that would be fine too. Um, but he didn't sort of realize that. We didn't know that that was what was going on. And that's a perfect, silly little example of having two different values, two different things that matter, that we didn't know what the other person mattered, what mattered to the other person. And so we couldn't talk about it up, up front initially. And everything changed once we talked about it. And mm -hmm. Jeff was able to go, oh, like you would rather stay home and save the money, which is fine, like with him. And it would have been fine with me. But then once he realized, it's not that I'm irresponsible or I don't care about the debt or whatever. It was that I just didn't like the taste of water. And Isn't that crazy? That's, yeah. So that's yeah. a silly example. But it's of those silly examples that day-to-day -day marriage stuff comes up. And that's an example of the kind of thing where neither of us was de demonstrably kind of objectively right or wrong. It was just two different things that mattered to us. And for most couples, that is a fairly big cause of conflict. And we don't even know that it's happening. Right. No, it's, and I thought that was such a great example because it, it does seem like a silly little thing, but when it builds up, because I'm sure it wasn't like the one time it happened <laughs> it that, you know, it continued to happen, but it's all those little things. And then you have throw in like a bigger purchase and, oh, it's there. And so, yeah, I think it's so important because my husband was known, he managed a team of people for a finance company. And so he was known as being the thrift pro because he was like, you know, let's be responsible. This isn't our own money. This, you know, for their budgets, he's like, this is the, yeah. the investor's money. And yeah. so we want to be mindful of how we're spending it with our, you know, with our business expenses and things like that. And so um, we had a team dinner at our house and his team came over and I think they expected us to live in like a cabin, like so, or like something tiny. It's like, we're, you know, we try to be really thrifty, but like, yeah. if we can find value, then we'll do it. But it was, it was so funny because his team literally, Steve went out of the room and they're like, okay, how in the heck did you talk your husband into buying a beautiful home? And I was like, it all comes down to value. But this is an example of something that does happen, which is yeah. the husband and wife are totally on the same page about many of those things. You guys both were pretty thrifty, pretty frugal. You valued savings. You valued purchasing something that had a big perceived value. That's awesome. But actually what we found is that for the vast majority of couples, they're not necessarily on the same page on everything on that way. And it's really common to have one person be more of the saver and one mm -hmm. person even if they still value saving, there's usually one person in the relationship who's more of a spender than the other, even if they're not really a spender. Right. Um, and so you often have this kind of disconnect where you have one person, and I hate to say this, I'm going to probably nail a few of my saver friends out there, <laughs> <laughs> but you have one person who sometimes is kind of looking down their nose at the other person and going, well, clearly you're just not wise with money. You know, you clearly just aren't thinking properly. We actually found, by the way, that two thirds of people said that on the survey. They're like, if my spouse would just think things through clearly, they would certainly agree with me. <laughs> like, you poor thing. Just, oh, oh no, totally. And so that's the problem is that we tend to make these value judgments against the other person, not realizing it's literally, they're just a different personality. They're going to care about different things. And it doesn't mean that you're right and they're wrong. It's both are legitimate opinions. No. And by oh, the yeah. way, I know that you're going to get some angry emails from people if I stop there. So hold on. <laughs> let, me, let me just also have a caveat that. That is in the vast majority of cases. There are going to be exceptions where somebody has like got a gambling addiction or something where anyone, you had a hundred people lined up and you asked, is this objectively right or wrong? You'd have all 100 people say objectively there's an issue here, but that's a tiny, tiny minority of cases. And it goes beyond what we can cover, you know, and beyond what yeah. we can cover in the research. The majority of the time, there isn't one objective standard. It's just, you care about different things and you've got to understand what the other person cares about if you're ever going to come together and be on the same page. 
Oh, absolutely. And it's funny because using the example that I was giving, what's, I think what threw his team off is that, you know, <laughs> it was like our one, like we picked something <laughs> because yes. he yes. was teased incessantly. One of his funniest stories that he would tell is that he picked up the president of his company in an old, like not totally junky, but kind of junky Dodge dynasty that we drove until it literally died. And, awesome. um, but it was funny because like, he's literally tells this story about how, you know, he's like, Oh, it's a little hot in here. He's like, Oh, here I, he, re <laughs> he reaches across and he unrolls. <laughs> Cause there's no AC. Yeah. There's your air conditioning. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, it's just like, but it is, it's like, you have to make choices. And sometimes you don't both see the value in things. And one of the story, one of the other analogies, you guys use so many great, and I think in pictures, so it really helped me to hear you guys talk through pictures. But one of the analogies I really liked was when you talked about that cliff fear and how, you know, how men to, I mean, again, please, anyone watching, we're talking in generalities here for the most part, <laughs> but men, you know, a, a big motivator for them is security and protect the family. And so there's this line, this cliff that they don't want to fall over. And women, we have this must protect, you know, am I good? You know, like all these different, I mean, not must protect, but like the I'm like trying to think of how to generalize <laughs> like myself. It's probably but, the best way to say is the, are we okay? That's yeah. the cliff. You don't right, right. When I was reading it, the, the thing that was like crazy to me is I'm like, you're like, there's two different cliffs that you're both afraid of. We're both not standing at the same edge and looking over. Yeah. And I was like, no way. That's so true. It's like, it we're both fighting this, this fear or this enemy, this perceived like, ah, and it, they're two totally different sides that we're trying to balance. Well, and the reason that that it becomes such a thing mm -hmm. is that it's so deep in our hearts as men or as women. And I should say, just to make every, sure everybody knows this, most of what we found was not gender related at all. I know there's a lot of gender stereotypes around money, like the guy's always a saver and the woman is always spending the money. And that's not true. It turns out it's about 50-50 on both sides. So most of this isn't gender related, but it turns out that this one this really was statistically very gender related. And um, most men, not all, most men, um, about seven out of 10 ish, um, really do have this feeling like I am about to fall, the whole family is going to fall over the cliff's head financially, so to speak, and die financially. Mm -hmm. I am not enough to provide for the family. Like it's really this fear of, am I going to be able to provide? And so there's this instinctive, like knee jerk gut level desire to stay away from that edge, which is mm -hmm. during normal times, even not to mention times of economic uncertainty, it makes a guy feel like he has to work a lot of hours, for example, um, mm -hmm. to stay in the boss's good graces. So there's no chance that he could get fired or whatever his concern is. And, and the problem is that's an example of something that triggers his wife's cliff fear because seven out of 10 of the women, their fear, yeah, they're worried about money just like anybody else's, but it's not this feeling like I'm not going to be enough to keep us from falling. The, the, the worry about falling for a woman is like, is everybody healthy and happy? Is everybody okay? And if you, my husband are stressed and upset and working a bazillion hours and you're walking around with the black cloud of doom hanging out over your head, then the answer to are we okay is no. Yeah. And so she's going to try to do things to stay away from her edge. Like, let's go out to dinner. Let's like, I was talking to the wife of a police officer who was working a ton of hours, as you can imagine, and, and going, okay, so how do we get more time together? You know, the kids haven't seen you, whatever. Let's go to dinner. Let's meet you near the station and go out to dinner. And then that makes him more stressed because that pulls him closer right. to his edge because that involves spending money. So that's a, it's a, again, it's kind of a silly example, but this is deep in our hearts. And we have to understand what is being triggered, not just in our spouse, but in ourselves oh, in yeah. order to have this conversation. And it's so simple and it's kind of fascinating to figure out how you're wired, like you yourself, like you said, when you were reading the book, you're like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. <laughs> well, I think I went into it. I'm like, oh, this would be great. I'm going to feel good about myself. <laughs> Not that I felt bad about myself, 
But I was like, oh, oh, because it is deeper. And like, even that example, I felt like it took me back to four women only. I'm like, right. You know, like, I forget that that is the underlying thing. Because as much as my husband and I have in common on making financial decisions, we have a lot not in common too. And that you were touching on triggers. And that is such a big thing is I feel like we're, I, I call them landmines. Because <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's not just a trigger. It's like, kapshoo, kapshoo. <laughs> it's like, wow. Because I don't know, like some of them are so deep rooted. <clears throat> you don't realize they're there. And so they no. step on something and there's so much of our, I think that was one other thing you mentioned in the book too, is that, that family of origin, oftentimes we're making financial decisions based on our past and based on yeah. what we're coming out of too. And so, yeah, whew, so very fun. much, very, very much so. Although yeah. I will point out, it's really hard to predict because people are like, oh, well, I'm a saver because like, you know, we had one guy sat down at an interview that we were doing a back to back interviews. And he said, you know, I grew up poor, so I save everything. I never want to feel that way again. So I ever save everything. Literally the next couple that sat down, the husband said, I grew up poor and never want to feel that way again. So I take the family out to eat all the time because I never want to have that feeling of not having money and not being able to do stuff. So two people who have the exact same situation and it's not the situation. It turns out it's how you respond to it. So anyway, it, we could talk about this all day, but I know we're running out of time. And, oh uh, no, it's so good. So but good. no, it's, it's true. It's funny. Cause it just, and you don't know how it's all going to play because my husband and I came from different backgrounds, but we have similar feelings and yet we have friends that come for similar situations in us and it's totally different. So yeah. it's fat. And it's just, it goes down to God created all of us unique and we yeah. <laughs> like, that's just it. And well, it's different he combinations. Created, he created us differently and he asks us two people to become one. Mm. And the only way to really do that is to understand each other. And like I said, kind of understand yourself. Like literally we tell people, read the book with a pen in hand and don't read it about oh. your spouse. Read it about yourself. Oh yeah, right? I know. It, it's you know? definitely marked up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so good. And I literally, I, I was like, oh my goodness. I, I mean, I told my husband, I'm like, we need to read. I go, you need to read something. I'm like, no, we should read it together. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's so good. And I love, I just love how you, you guys have, I mean, you can tell that you, it's not like this is your first book out. Like, I love that you really pulled on the other information. It just seemed like such a perfect book for what you already had a foundation for. Um, and like awesome. I said, it made me think of, you know, for women only and some of the other books that um, I've read of yours and it was just so good. So thank you for you and your husband writing this together. Cause that was, it's just fun to get the perspective of both of you at the same time and sharing your stories, like your diet Coke story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, so all of us have those stories. So I'm sure you have your, all your listeners, go figure out what those stories are because I know. that's going to give you the insight into what's going on. It really does. No, in fact, I always, I'm a, I'm, this is my weird, my organizational hack for everyone listening when you read a book is that in the back, I'm not going to show you my notes. <laughs> Because they're personal, but um, in the back of every book, um, I take notes on what what's standing out to me, what I want to remember, and what I'm going to take action on. So I don't have to go thumbing through the whole book. So I have everything in one place. But it's, it's funny because a book that I, I I found myself hesitating a little because I'm like, oh, I want I want my husband and I. So I almost need to get him his own copy if I'm going to put my <laughs> if I don't want to share them necessarily, because sometimes it's a raw thought, and it's like well, I need perspective here. This is just my raw thought off of this, and. That's yeah, good. But well, yeah, and actually you could if you if you wanted to. Now this is this is just a thought. But if you wanted to, if you could tell him, now don't read the stuff in the back of the book. But read my notes about myself in the different pages. Honestly, yeah. Frankly, we tell people, right? Take the notes about yourself like, "Oh my gosh, this explains why I got upset the other day or whatever." And then they read that. Yeah. And they're a personalized tour into how you feel. And then you can do the same thing for them. Yeah, that's so good. And you guys have a study coming up. Is it on this book? Is it, am I, I, I'm, I'm asking that without knowing. <laughs> yeah, I read that somewhere. <laughs> There's going to be hopefully the ability for everybody to kind of go through this in a little more depth. We're doing a lot of stuff. There's also an assessment. If people Ooh. are interested, yes. You can actually go to thriveandloveandmoney.com and there's an assessment. It takes five minutes, but it's really sneakily robust to try to get at where you're starting. 
Ooh, I like that. I'm like, that sounds like adventurous right there. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, where can people not, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're going to say wherever books are sold, um, but where can people connect with you and, you know, find your book and find the resources that you guys have and that are coming out as well? Well, the best place is probably thriveandloveandmoney.com. Okay. That's the overall website for this in particular initiative. And they can, people can get the assessment and kind of check it out. And there's actually some resources for churches because, oh my gosh, right now churches are filled with people that are concerned about money and, you know, what is this time of economic uncertainty going to mean? Because it oh, might be yeah. for some time. And um, so we have some resources for pastors too. So. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah, because this book is coming at a great time. Everyone's, you know, I mean, we're not in quarantine. Well, who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? <laughs> out, who knows? <laughs> but, you know, between, you know, just, you know, maybe not joblessness, but just like you said, financial uncertainty and just different dynamics within households as well, just as far as like some mm -hmm. people are having to work from home and they haven't been before and all kinds of stuff. So it's a great time to get to yeah. the heart of it because it has been heartbreaking too, because as I know, a lot of people who are on social media are seeing, you know, these power couples yeah. saying, Hey, I'm, we're getting, you know, thrown in the towel or filing yeah. for divorce. And it's been heart wrenching to see this. And I'm like, Oh, hang in there. But I, I mean, I get everybody has their own dynamic. We're not getting into that, but well, the thing, like the thing that the, honestly, that does make a difference. And I will just, I'll leave you with this sort of thought is that this, it used to be in a time of great prosperity, you know, you can kind of get away with you do your thing over here and I do my thing over here financially. A lot of couples handle things that way. Mm -hmm. Not you, clearly, Christy, but a lot of couples. <laughs> Maybe me and Jeff. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, when you face a time like this, that's not going to work anymore. And it's a really, really good opportunity to say, since we're going to have to talk about money anyway, let's figure out how to do it well so that we can come together mm. and figure out how to plan and what does God want us to do during this time. No, I love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate yeah. it and love the book and I always love the opportunity to chat with you. You too, Christy. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simply Joyful Podcast. Be sure to check out all the episodes available by going to simplyjoyfulpodcast.com. Also, be sure to subscribe here on YouTube so you don't miss all of the other videos that we have coming your way. Have a great rest of your week and don't forget to live simply and be joyful.